it's Melanie Brady. As the Education Associate for APRA Headquarters, I would like to welcome you to today's GGNA Online Solutions Showcase, The Value of Predictive Analytics. Today's presenter is Connor Casey of GGNA. Connor Casey, Consultant Analytics, is primarily responsible for the delivery and strategic implementation of GGNA's analytics services, including Donorscape, DonorScape well screening, and predictive modeling. In his role, Connor analyzes data to inform management decisions and drive growth for his clients. Connor works closely with his clients, which range across all sectors of today's vast, vast philanthropic landscape, in order to identify and implement data-driven strategies aimed at developing and maintaining efficient, effective, and sustainable development programs by targeting unique segments for cultivation and solicitation. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please keep in mind that a recording of this webcast will be available for purchase in the online store by the end of the day today. Feel free to submit questions throughout the event via the question and answer box on your webinar toolbar. Our speaker will leave some time at the end of the presentation to address these. Following the event, you will be asked to evaluate today's session. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. And with that, I would like to welcome today's presenter. Please go ahead, Connor. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, first and foremost, Thank you to, to all those who are uh, registered and, and attending currently. I appreciate your time, and I'm excited to walk through this and um, give you what, what I perceive as the true values, I should say, really, of predictive analytics. Of course, the parenthetical title there would, the, would be the value of predictive analytics in development. Um, and the capabilities that I see in predictive analytics um, that go much further beyond wealth ratings and likelihood scores um, and some of the things that you're used to associating uh, predictive modeling or predictive analytics with. Um, of course, that's included too, um, but I want to I want to kind of expand uh, in certain cases uh, the way you think about predictive analytics. I use I use predictive analytics as opposed to predictive modeling. Um, you know, at least the term, um, and I'll sort of exp that's intentional, and I'll, I'll sort of explain why on the coming slides here. Um, so basically the agenda of, of this talk is going to be um, an introduction of um, detailing predictive analytics the way that I see it um, and the way that I hope you'll come away from this talk uh, seeing it as well. Uh, and that is much more than, than just wealth ratings and likelihood to give scores. Uh, and then we'll talk about what some of those capabilities beyond traditional research are uh, in my eyes um, and the way you can use those insights in order to support management and programmatic decisions and, and, and also staffing decisions. And then we'll talk about predictive analytics um, as, it, as a diagnostic tool set, so ways in which you can use the findings here and, and um, the observations that are, you're able to glean from it in order to examine um, and evaluate the health of your development program and assess campaign readiness and, and progress also. Um, depending on where you in and that where you where you are in that process, um, always the fun topic. <laughs> we'll discuss timing and budget because uh, although it's it's not that exciting, uh, it is important, especially when we're talking about a, 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 a an engagement that tends to be you know um, somewhere in in the five figure range. Um, so we'll decide when the time how to know when the time is we'll determine when how to know when the time is right and also how to budget accordingly so that you're able to to kind of. Uh, um, pounce on the opportunity when when it's um, when it's been uh, determined that it's right, and then how to make the case, which of course is is always an issue. Um, how to move it up the ladder um, and use, and that's kind of a big part of what this whole talk will be about is is uh, being able to frame predictive analytics and predictive modeling in a way that uh, that makes it look like more than just candy for um, you know prospect research and management. Um, so to, to, to really stress and emphasize those capabilities beyond traditional research. Um, so you can get buy-in from, from senior level um, AVPs, um, chief development officers, and those at the executive level, um, leadership in development. And then a little bit on applying basic concepts um, that you, you, you can garner and learn from, from larger scale predictive analytics projects on your own, in-house, uh, and, and become, um, at least to a certain degree, um, sort of an in-house uh, research analyst, um, and that can be fun too, and it enables you to the opportunity to get a little more creative with your work. Um, so I'll go ahead and move through here then, starting with the introduction on uh, predictive analytics as I see it. So in, in many of my conversations with clients and prospective clients, all too often it seems to me that the, the term predictive analytics or um, 
really predictive modeling especially, uh, which is why I use predictive analytics instead of that term, um, has become a, a sort of a catch-all phrase for likelihood to give ratings and scores. And th that partially is, is probably to do with just what else are we going to call it? You have to call likelihood ratings and scores something. Um, but it, in my opinion, it has sort of devalued the true nature and benefits of predictive, an predictive analytics um, and its capabilities beyond beyond just those ratings and scores and, and um, the applications to traditional research. Um, so again, I hope to enforce the value of predictive, predictive analytics and position it as it was originally intended. Um, a process that really, in service that delivers far more than just those kinds of ratings for, for wealth and, and likelihood to give. Um, in fact, it, it can deliver much more candid insights that extend far beyond traditional research, as I mentioned. Uh, and with a real, true, well done predictive analytics engagement or project, what you, what you can and should be able to do uh, with your development colleagues is, uh, are a number of things. And, and again, these will be sort of peppered throughout the presentation. Um, but first is, and this is one we already know, of course, but enhanced prospect identification, research, and management or development um, by measuring who has financial capacity to support your organization or institution and also the affinity specific to you. So not only, you know, who has a um, million dollars or more in capacity, but also is likely to give, to make a major gift to your organization as opposed to the one next door. Um, and also the way that predictive analytics can serve as a diagnostic tool set that enables development, leadership, and, and support staff um, to assess campaign readiness and progress as we move through a campaign. Um, really gauge the potential for philanthropic support among your constituency using a little more than just those wealth and capacity estimates. Um, so taking into consideration um, a formula that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that, that weights both those elements, um, so capacity to give, uh, along with their, their affinity specific to you in order to decide um, and determine the value of, of, of that, the approximate value of that particular, of any given particular uh, prospect within your pool. Um, and so that can help, of course, when deciding uh, where to, where to, how to more efficiently allocate your time, energy, and resources um, as a development program, um, and as you in research, of course. Uh, then also how it can inform portfolio, pipeline, and, and moves management. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, increase operational efficiencies by analyzing historical giving patterns, which of course lay the foundation for any sort of predictive analysis. Um, and then through that prioritizing segments within the prospect pool, and I'll talk about that uh, more as well. Um, identify and realize opportunities for growth uh, in certain areas of the development program. Um, I'll have some examples for that. Identify pro programmatic weaknesses and inefficiencies and work towards solutions. Um, benchmark to a certain degree your institutional performance um, with, against uh, or compared to other uh, similar institutions. Um, and you can overlay things like age uh, with that too and, and lifetime total cumulative giving. And then cleansing and enriching the data within your database, uh, which is, um, at least in the way we do it here at GGNA, that is a, a nice byproduct of um, an engagement like this, a predictive analytics engagement. So to start with the capabilities beyond traditional research, um, before, I, before I go any further, I will, um, you'll see here that I have a number of charts in here. Um, those are, and that, I'm, that I'm using primarily just to illustrate um, certain points made throughout this talk. Um, what those are are just sample replicas of, of client deliverables that I created. So um, just really the data is not real, um, but they, they look like our client to, some of our client deliverables. Um, and I created them, like I said, in order to illustrate some points throughout. Um, not all the numbers will line up, of course, but that's, that's beside the point. Uh, what's important are the observations and recommendations one can derive from the findings in these uh, analyses and, and the charts. Um, so back to what we were talking about, though. Um, just wanted to give a sort of a, a disclaimer there. Um, the predictive analytics can be used in a, in a number of ways that may not immediately be obvious to you in, in your research shop. Um, or to um, higher level uh, senior leadership that you're trying to uh, sell this idea to and get buy-in from. Um, and those will include supporting the case for creating, bolstering, or reinvigorating components of the development program. So for instance, if you have a, a your, your constituency is an old, of an older nature um, and planned giving is, is an area that you admittedly 
um, don't don't focus enough resources in. Uh, maybe very limited staff in the in the plan giving department. Um, this can help support a, a case for um, maybe increasing staff there and thinking about uh, reinvigorating that program. Um, also driving programmatic, this, this sort of dovetails off that, driving programmatic and management decisions around staffing and the reallocation of resources. Um, I mean that in, in, a, in the way that it sounds, um, just by, by doing things like I mentioned with, with planned giving, um, and I'm using that just as an example, um, but also thinking about reallocation of resources in, in gift officer portfolios um, and you know, making sure you're managing your best prospects uh, and, and, and not those who are um, determined from the analysis uh, lower value prospects in terms of capacity and affinity. Um, and also thinking about um, whether you need more gift officers on staff um, and uh, whether they need to be distributed throughout the country depending on, on, on where many of these prospects are based. Um, also planning for a capital campaign and, and measuring the feasibility of a preliminary campaign goal before one is you know, um, even in a silent phase. Um, deciding where to focus your time, energy, and resources once a campaign is public and has been underway for some time, maybe a couple of years. Uh, and examining the health of your development program. So once again, that goes back to the, the diagnostic applications of, of a project like this. Understanding your prospect pipeline and what that means to the development program. Um, there's a chart that, that we'll look at that sort of um, sort of illustrates the sustainability. Um, and also evaluating prospects under active management and in portfolios. So making ensuring that you're managing your best prospects and, and cultivating toward their their next cultivating them toward their next gifts. Um, and you're, you're you're focusing your time, energy, and, and resources in the right places as as researchers. Um, also, then of course moving those prospects into the appropriate stages and then and on through the donor life cycle, uh, ever important. And improving upon weaknesses or operational uh, and administrative efficiencies, inefficiencies as a byproduct of the process. That uh, sort of goes along with um, cleansing and, and enriching data in your database, but also some others. And I have a, I have a particular example um, with a client of mine in, on the East Coast uh, who they had a lot of problems. They, had, they were a performing arts uh, institution, so they had a lot of problems because they had not only their, their donor management database, the traditional type of database, but also a number of, and they also they didn't have their own venue, so they had they had they uh, hosted um, events um, at a variety of venues. So they had to they had many databases from which they had to pull data, including you know ticket buyer type data and, and uh, patron data, um, and it was a real problem for them, and it was one that they were forced to. Uh, to reconcile and to tackle um, in order to complete this project that, that they did uh, in part because they are thinking about the feasibility of a campaign. Um, so it, we were able, as a byproduct of, of the, the standard predictive analytics project we were, we were contracted to do, they sort of internally um, were able to uh, enhance their, their data management protocols um, for, uh, to support research and the frontline fundraisers. Um, this this slide this chart here, like I said, once again, it's just a sample replica of the type of client deliverables will do as part of a predictive analytics project. Um, this is meant sort of to, for the most part, to underscore um, what I'm talking about when I, when I say managing your best prospects. Um, so what we're seeing here is along the left, along the top, we're seeing these different codes and. Um, all you really need to understand here is that the A's uh, are, are sort of a like it's sort of a likelihood score, um, also a measure of connectivity and, and engagement um, of these individuals with this particular institution, this hypothetical one. Um, whereas an E is, is not that uh, connected, very uh, much more unlikely to to make any sort of philanthropic uh, commitment or contribution in, in the near term. Um, so that's what we're seeing along the top, the horizontal axis. Along this vertical axis, we're seeing those, those capacity ratings, gift capacity ratings, so what they might be able to give over a five-year period to um, any of their favorite charitable organization. Um, and so that's when we overlay those with their likelihood, specifically the affinity ratings kind of specifically to, to how much they like you. So A, meaning they like you a lot. E, um, at least from what we, we can tell in the analysis, don't much. Um, and we have this broken out into kind of two segments. The, the one at the top are, are all those prospects. In this case, it's a total of uh, 
5,017 who are under active management uh, in a gift officer portfolio or development officer portfolio. And down at the bottom here, we have unassigned. So those who are currently not under active management, um, not in one of those portfolios. And as you can see, there are much more of those, um, around 650,000. Uh, and what we were able to do here as part of this analysis by overlaying their capacity with their affinity specific to, to you uh, is identify in, in, the, in the top box here these 958 lower value prospects in terms of capacity and affinity who are currently under management but perhaps shouldn't be. Um, we can have some conversations around why are we focusing our time and energy and, and resources on these 958 individuals. I'm sure out of some of those there are some good reasons. Um, but even if even uh, even if 25 percent a uh, quarter of that 958 figure are really aren't great prospects and we can't figure out why um, they're under active management, then we should get them out of there and uh, begin to think about replacing them with this almost 2,000, which is, is admittedly, um, depending on the organization, that's a whole lot um, more than, than than any particular organization can uh, can effectively manage at one time. Um, but there are also probably some reasons in here. Um, so there's probably some folks in this this almost $2,000 box of high value unassigned prospects who have made it clear to you that they're not going to give um, anymore and then and for some reason they, they hate you now. Um, but still if we take again if we take a quarter of that we can replace it with um, we can replace um, reallocate these resources so that we're, we're putting the we're managing the right prospects your best prospects um, and your time is being well spent um, and that's obviously uh, very important for not just research uh, also the major gifts team and um, something for, for leadership to consider as well now on a, to look at this as a diagnostic tool set and there'll be there'll be more charts and, and similar things here uh, in this section uh, they can do a lot, uh, predictive analytics can, in terms of examining uh, the current health of your development program um, and projecting, of course, future performance, hence the name predictive uh, analytics. Um, so first of all, we can identify patterns in historical giving behavior, um, determine where the majority of philanthropic support comes from and, and, um, and what that means for your program moving forward. Also, compare your institution to other similar institutions using factors like lifetime cumulative total giving and, and age. Um, see where you stand in relation to your peers. Um, evaluate the sustainability of your major gifts pipeline and identify strong leadership level annual giving prospects in the process. Uh, use a simple formula that, that weighs capacity and affinity in order to determine and measure the value, uh, approximate value of prospects in portfolios. And get a clear picture of prospects in active stages and in some cases the need for additional staff. Um, and or uh, more effective moves management. Um, so if we have a lot stuck in cultivation, uh, why is that? Um, or do we not have the, the fundraising staff to, and these are questions research can ask, um, do we not have the fundraising staff to, in order to see these folks, to visit them and make asks? Um, what is the underlying reason there? Uh, and I have um, these here charts that illustrate all of those points just about. So the first is this historical giving analysis um, in this hypothetical case, we have um, 900, or excuse me, uh, 98,850 donor households um, with more than 145 million in total lifetime giving. Um, and out of those donor households, as you can you can s sort of see in this top bracket here, um, there it's broken up in these three brackets. Seven of those individuals have, uh, or households, have lifetime giving over one million, and they account uh, just, just those seven households account for 12% of all the dollars raised by this particular organization. Um, looking a little close, closer at sort of these these little boxes, you see there are three of them. The top one here that says uh, 65 households have given 22% of the dollars raised. Without looking and getting too granular into the, the actual data and the, the figures we're seeing there, let's just consider what that means. Um, and really what I think that means is it, it, it almost 7% of the constituency here or the donor households um, make up almost a quarter of the total giving um, to this organization. So this sort of underscores the, the need, uh, well, the fact that major and, and principal gifts are going to be your, your most efficient um, way to, to, to when, you're, when you're cultivating major gift prospects, that, that's your most efficient way to, to raise a large amount of, of, of money, of course. Um, and also, it's 
going to be uh, that's that's it's it's your top heavy in that case um, to a certain degree, uh, and you're going to want to continue to focus your energy there um, in the major principal and major gifts area. Um, then, if we look at the bottom, though, um, we see that, and it's being top heavy in that case is I would actually like to see it even more top heavy in this particular case. Um, it's a good thing, uh, I think. Um, but of course, we don't want to we don't want to discount uh, the the lower level, uh, perhaps. Uh, donors to the annual fund, um, because at least in this example here, um, that means that the lower 91% of donor households account for almost half of the total giving. Um, so although it's not quite as efficient, um, you're not going it, it doesn't it doesn't move the needle as much with each gift. Uh, in cumulatively, it, it moves the needle quite a bit uh, in terms of total giving to the organization. Um, and so you're going to want to continue what you're doing there, um, to put it simply. Um, in the middle, this is where it gets really interesting. We have, in this case, a little over 9,000 households um, who have given, um, not at a low level, but um, you know, between 2,500 and 100,000. Um, so obviously, those at the lower end of the spectrum, and then there, there are those at the higher end of the spectrum what we want to do in order to increase efficiencies here is to run some queries within whichever whichever platform you have that uh, where this data is housed, um, figure out who these individuals are, and get them. You want to try to get them to behave more so like the top segment here, those 65 households. Um, and obviously, you can't get all. 9,298 in order to act like those 65 households. But if you can get another 65 households to um, behave, behave more like those six, the, like like the 65 we already have in the top, that'll do wonders for the program. Um, and and these are these are points that uh, obviously research comes in to identify who those likely households may be. Um, and and these are points that you can make along with the along with uh, leadership in order to to really. Um, Emphasize the need for for a project like this. Um, so you want to focus on the middle for upgrade and to see if we can get them to behave more like those in the top segment. Um, moving on. Right here is sort of what I mentioned in terms of a, an institutional comparison or, or a benchmark. Um, so what we're seeing here is along the vertical axis, we see all these levels of lifetime cumulative or cumulative lifetime giving. Um, and we're overlaying that with, with age, which you can see in, at the end of each of these bars here. The top one's 70 years old, the next one is 68. Um, well, just the, um, what, what, the, what the darker blue, the darker color here is, is standing for is, is this, the particular organization. Um, and the, the lighter blue, the lighter color just underneath each of those is our, our GG&A benchmark, so from similar institutions. Um, sort of peer institutions of, of, of this particular one. Um, and what we're seeing across the board here is this is a very, this constituency is much older than um, uh, at, these, at these giving levels. They, they're much older than that we typically see. Uh, and that means uh, a number of things, um, one of which would be really that um, that you need to think about First of all, without anything else, you may we may want to think about blended asks at this point um, for not just major giving, but major gifts, but also planned gifts and bequests. Um, and also, you want to make sure that your 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 prospect pipeline and your major gift pipeline, in, in particular, is strong enough to because these folks aren't going to be around forever. It's the it's the reality is strong enough to carry you through um, the point when most of these individuals uh, are, are pass and are deceased. Um, so you and also you have some conversations about acquiring new donors uh, and taking some of those, like I said, moving um, moving a lot of those folks in the middle who, who may not be quite as in this older range of, of, of 70 years and such um, to to behave like those uh, those top performing households that we looked at in the previous slide. This illustrates that point to a, a little bit more. Um, so if we look at this once again in the in this, in this we see it, we have almost 5,000 top-rated um, major gift prospects. That just means these A, Bs, and Cs um, that you're seeing under the major gift code here uh, on the left-hand side of the chart. Um, and 
the majority, the vast majority of them are, are 65 uh, years old or older, and that's 86% of them. Um, and that's what we're seeing in this sort of shaded box here um, under number of constituents age. You get uh, by age, you have 65 to 74, and then 75 plus. Um, so you have a total of, of 4,278 there. And like I said, that's the vast majority of these top rated major gift prospects. Um, when we, we want to think about donor sustainability and making sure that pipeline remains strong um, once those individuals pass on, um, we look at this sort of, this box that's, that's outlined with this red it's the red outline box here that you're seeing more so to the left left hand side, um, and those are 131 prospects who are rated at that that top major gift level those A, Bs, and Cs um, in our analysis that's how we code them, um, and they are ages uh, under 35 to up to uh, 50 54. Um, and they represent, they, as you can see here, they represent a really good opportunity for your, for the program to continue developing its major gifts pipeline. Um, and they should be, um, especially those in the, the 45 to 54 range, uh, age range, they should be um, considered as uh, they should they should be considered real strong major gift prospects. But uh, of course, research this is where you come in to to decide that um, and determine that factor, and also. Um, Nonetheless, those who are, are not quite ready to be uh, to give at the major gift level, at the big gift level, um, they make up a real good sort of um, identified for you already um, leadership level annual giving um, pool right there based on their capacity, their affinity for you, and their, their age. And then that, of course, drives them to, to eventually become major gift prospects in many cases or major gift donors in many cases. Now here we're looking at uh, a little bit more about prospects, assigned prospects in stages and uh, some moves management here. And also I'll explain why this is uh, useful as a diagnostic um, visual here. So we have these um, all assigned households here and you can see the number of them in the top here, number of assigned households in the middle is the percentage of assigned households. Um, within the, the file, or you know, the, the 234, um, whatever the percentage that is compared to the total. Um, and at the bottom, we have something that is a percentage of total adjusted value uh, of assigned households. And what that is is some adjusted portfolio value is a term that we have at GGNA for um, really determining it, it's, a, it's an algorithm of, uh, and a formula for determining the true value to your organization, um, each prospect's true value to your organization. So in this case, we're looking at it in an aggregate here, so not just one prospect, but 234 in this, in this first one in discovery. Um, and we're, we're weighting different things like their, their, capa their the capacity to give and also their level of connect connectivity to, to the individual um, or to the specific organization. Um, what we're seeing here in the, in the first two, uh, these two top rows are, um, you know, they're going to line up because it's a number and an associated percentage. What we would hope to see uh, in, in a best scenario would be in this bottom row um, where we have the, you know, some adjusted portfolio value percentage there. Um, we would hope that, that would sort of mirror what we're seeing in the top um, in, a, in, a, in a very healthy organization. Um, the development program, that's usually what, it would, what we would like to see and that's what it should look like. Uh, obviously in this case we're not seeing that. We're seeing um, a whole lot of prospects in stewardship, which is fine, um, especially if they, they had just finished up a campaign or closed the campaign um, in recent years, but we're seeing a whole lot of an, an inordinate amount here in cultivation. Um, and not so not so many in solicitation and um, and the proposal stage. So what we might want to talk about here is why are they stuck in cultivation, um, and um, what can we do to move them through the donor life cycle and move them through the next stages here. Um, so first first of all, you want to make sure that. Um, you have the staff to support that, that, that sort of moves management, so you have the staff to go out and that would be my first discussion. 
you have the staff to go out and visit these individuals and make asks? Um, and if so, why aren't they doing it? Um, and secondly, maybe you, maybe if they don't have the staff, um, that they, the amount of staff they need in order to, to visit all these folks, um, they need to prioritize who needs to be visited immediately. Um, and then, and then as a third stage, um, or as a second stage, uh, within the next three months, and then one within the next, the third stage would be those who need to be visited within the next 12 months, um, and and um, need to need to be have a proposal in front of them, and and, and the ask needs to be made. Um, and if there's a problem, if, if if most of these individuals here are in cultivation stuck there, um, are just they're not near um, any of the gift officers or development officers um, and frontline fundraisers, then we need to talk about some some ideas of, of maybe expanding that staff um, to include different geographical areas and have, they can you know they would have their own areas in their states that they're in charge of, of managing prospects who, who live in those areas. On to timing and budget. Uh, again, always fun. Um, so as, as, as you all know, large-scale predictive analytics tend to be fairly expensive because nice things usually are. Uh, things that are, that you, when you get delivers, deliverables like this, um, it's going to, the fees are going to add up, of course. Um, and the fees for a thorough, well-done predictive analytics project, generally, uh, this depends on the number of records that you, you the client wants in, in a, to include in the model. Of course, uh, but they generally will amount somewhere between twenty thousand and fifty thousand um, in total fees. Uh, and again, that depends on the size of your program and the amount of records that, that you'd like analyzed. Um, but of course, this underscores the need to think carefully about project timing and year-to-year -year budgets. Um, so you want to be sure that if the time is right, that you have it in the budget to uh, to embark on an, on, a, on an engagement like this. Um, so as always, timing is key, just like it is with most everything else in life. Um, so I would urge you to ask yourself these, these pretty basic questions. How well do I as a researcher know the constituency, or how well do I understand them and, and their, their, um, their capacity, their, um, their level of connectivity and, and engagement and affinity specific to, to my organization, um, and those who are, are, are our best donors? Uh, how well do the frontline fundraisers know the, the constituency? Um, is it do they only know what you give them as researchers, or do they have a better idea? Obviously, they might have a better idea on a more personal uh, relationship level uh, in some cases. Um, but uh, in the aggregate, how well do they know it? Um, is the senior leadership in place, or the the AVP or the chief development officer, relatively new, um, or have they been there for for a long time? And also, what do you know about their? Um, this is sort of a sidebar, but what do you know about their opinion of, of fundraising analytics and, and, and things like this. Um, ever important, how long has it been since we last engaged in an all-inclusive screening and or predictive modeling project? Um, obviously, uh, the, the ratings and the, and the scores and these types of things that you're using in your day-to-day -day research, um, you know, data, data can become stale fairly quickly. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're doing this on a fairly regular basis. Um, of course, screening um, more regularly, I, I, would, I would encourage, um, because capacity is, is something that's external, and it's something that, that can, can change, go up, up or down, regardless of what you do uh, in development. Um, it's the, the con levels of connectivity and engagement um, and the way these folks feel about you and their affinity specific to your organization that that you have, uh, you can have an effect on as, as um, in the development world, um, and that's what it's all about: is getting them to be more engaged and connected to you. Um, so obviously, you want to run these, uh, or conduct these every now and then. Screening more often. First of all, it's, it's these days it's 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 more affordable, um, but predictive modeling you should think about it um, every five years or so would be my best practice uh, recommendation. It obviously depends on what type of organization you are um, and if you're in and out of campaigns at all. Um, well, I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, are there discussions about the feasibility of a capital campaign to be launched within the next two or three years? Um, if so, it's probably a good idea to um, gauge the, the true potential for philanthropic support among your constituency uh, and help to, help to determine um, whether or not uh, 
the campaign, uh, a large-scale comprehensive capital campaign is feasible. And if there's a, a goal, some sort of goal that's, that's not finalized but floating around, if that's feasible, of course. Uh, also, are you in the middle of a campaign or nearing campaign close? Um, that's just as important for assessing. You can assess, of course, not just campaign readiness, but also your progress. Um, and um, and helping to make, if you're really struggling with, uh, like you feel like the pipeline, the major gifts pipeline has really been tapped, then this can really help in, near the end of a campaign, especially I have a client who I was just with um, earlier in the summer, um, and uh, they had 10 months left in, in their campaign, um, just about, and they had uh, tapped most of their, um, of course, their known donors and also ones who would come out of the woodwork um, for principal and major gifts and leadership annual gifts as well. Um, but they, and they had surpassed their goal, but they wanted to, of course, um, of course, finish really strong and carry through with the campaign. So we went there to help them identify who those individuals are. And likely a lot of them um, have been sitting around during the whole campaign, well, not sitting around, but think to themselves now and then, um, you know, why haven't they come to see me? Why haven't I, why haven't I been visited? I, you know, I feel strongly about this, this institution. I have capacity to give. I would like to give. Um, and so a lot of times near the end of the campaign or, or somewhere around the middle is a great time to see those individuals. Um, and they can carry you through, like I said, for a, for a successful campaign close. Um, back to the questions, though. Does it, does it feel like you're really struggling to keep the pipeline, prospect pipeline strong? That goes to what I just mentioned. Um, and then something like we looked at when we were looking at the prospects in active stages, assigned prospects in active stages, is are about half or, or more of the pros managed prospects currently stuck in cultivation? And if so, um, you know, we, we could talk about we have discussions for, for why that may be. I mentioned them already earlier, um, but could be we need more staff. Could be that um, either in research or um, to really get um, thorough reports out to the frontline funders so that they feel comfortable visiting these individuals. Um, or it could be you need more major gift staff and frontline funders to see them. Or maybe you need them in different geographical areas. Um, and there's that way to prioritize them by those who need to be seen immediately, those to be sh seen within, uh, I would suggest, the next three. Um, we can push that to five months, but the next three months. And then those who need to be seen within the year, within the next 12 months, um, in order to move them through to the, um, the solicitation and, and proposal stages. It's also important to be prepared to engage, as I mentioned, in predictive analytics when the time is right and, and sort of pounce when the time is right. Um, instead of having it delayed for a year or so when it, when it may not, when, when you, because the need, obviously, when you determine it's right, the need is there right now, um, which means, again, that you have to have room available in the budget. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, many of my clients in high-performing development programs, uh, and I'm thinking of, in this case, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm thinking of higher ed institutions in particular. Um, typically engaged, and these are these are the really high performing ones that I work with. Um, so this isn't the case across the board, obviously. But typically engage in a predictive analytics project every three to five years, especially when they're when they're in campaign mode, when they're gearing up for a campaign, or they they've just launched it, or they're in the middle of the campaign, or about to close, and even sometimes um, after a campaign to to sort of assess the post campaign situation and help. Um, really reconfigure the, the major gifts pipeline um, for uh, moving forward. Um, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, you have to remember that reliable modeling scores that are like those A's and C's and other things that I've, that I've touched on um, that are based on a truly thorough in-depth analysis of your prospect pool will be static, unfortunately. They're not dynamic, um, at least in what, whichever database they're, they're being housed in. Of course, uh, you know, theoretically, you can you can affect their their connectivity, and they can change from a, from a, an E to a to a D or to go up. Um, but that's not going to those changes and in, in, in sentimentalities aren't going to be reflected in the in the data that you have as researchers at your fingertips, available to you um, in in any platform or, of course, your your, your more foundational um, donor management database. Um, so they will go stale eventually, uh, and they will require what I'm calling upgrades in future years, and that just means uh, another run of, of, the, of the model, um, which will, first of all, um, 
upgrade those and, and update them, but also identify new um, strong prospects for you. So in order to do any of this, uh, you got to make the case. And as researchers, um, sometimes uh, depending on exactly what your role is within the within development program, sometimes that can require um, a little bit of a climb up the ladder. Um, and I have some recommendations for making the case. First of all, any of this, uh, as you can tell, there are a lot of capabilities beyond um, what, what many of us think of as predictive modeling or predictive analytics, and just those wealth ratings and capacity scores. Um, and I, I would encourage you to, to use those uh, as much as you can um, within reason in order to help make the case. Uh, and so some of what I'm saying here um, may sound a little bit redundant because of that, um, but I, I kind of just want to hammer it in here. Um, so I would imagine that, that most of you would like to be able to engage in, in even just wealth screenings and, and predictive modeling projects more often. Um, Unfortunately, depending on senior leadership uh, and um, and the past experiences they've had with such projects, or especially transitions in leadership, as you know, can hold things up a lot. Um, the need for predictive analytics projects can often get deprioritized, um, and that's why it's essential to make a very strong case uh, for the need for such a for such an engagement. And making a case for this becomes much easier when you frame it as much more than, as I, as I have attempted to do in this, um, as much more than wealth ratings and likelihood scores, which uh, in the eyes of a lot of leadership, unfortunately, they're seeing that if you're coming to them or, or you know, passing the message up the ladder that uh, this is needed, they might think, oh, that, that, that's just, and this depends on the leader, obviously, but uh, sometimes they might think, of, oh, that's just candy for research, um, and they just want more toys to play with and more ratings and codes. Um, so that's why it's important to frame it in this way as much, much more than just those toys to play with and raise and codes, even though that is fun. Um, using many of the points made earlier in, 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 my, in my talk here, uh, you can make sure that you frame predictive analytics as a service that will help the program accomplish um, many, many things, uh, including the following here. And that's to enable development leadership and support staff to assess campaign readiness and or progress. And again, apologies if any of this is redundant. Um, but like I said, I'd want to hammer it in because it can really help you um, when you're trying to pass this through uh, the powers that be. Inform portfolio, pipeline, and moves management. Examine the, and evaluate the current health of the development program. Um, that can be helpful, especially post-campaign, like I said, assessing that post-campaign situation. Um, supporting plans for a capital campaign in part by measuring the true potential for philanthropic support among the constituency. And also, of course, the feasibility of any preliminary campaign goal that isn't official yet. Excuse me. Uh, you can also decide, help you decide where to focus your time, energy, and resources. Um, ensure that you're managing your best prospects, uh, which obviously goes in, in hand with that, with that bullet point just above it. Drive programmatic and management decisions around staffing and the reallocation of resources and improve upon weaknesses and operational or administrative efficiencies as a byproduct of the process. And I used that example um, that I gave about my client on the East Coast uh, where that happened um, and it has, uh, it has proven to be a very good thing for them uh, in a number of ways. Um, so I, of course, uh, it have, have had to make this case with, with leadership um, many times and often for more advanced analytics um, that include just predictive modeling, predictive analytics, some of the things that we that we touched on today, but even more things like major gift portfolio analysis and studies uh, really focused on moves management. I've had to make this case many times, um, as, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and I'm thinking uh, in particular that there, there's a there was one um, at that point, and they're a client now, but at one at one point, you know, they were a prospective client, and they had a need for this. There's no doubt about it. Uh, their CFO was not convinced of that fact. Uh, and this is a little bit different. It, it's obviously, it, you can probably tell, not a, um, not a higher ed client or anything like that. This was more in the arts and culture sector. Um, so the CFO was a little more involved in, in these kinds of decisions than, than otherwise he, he or she may have been. Um, so I, I had a call with, with just him uh, where he asked me a series of questions. What is the ROI? why we need to do this, and so forth. You know, wh why should we spend, I think the project was somewhere around twenty-five or 30000 
um, in the end. Uh, why should we spend all this? Why do we need you to help us with this? Uh, and I had to I had to make that case, and I used just about um, <laughs> every bullet point in here, plus probably more, uh, in order to do that. And at the end, he came away uh, very convinced. So my point there to all of you is it can really help you in, in pushing these things through and making sure that they happen. Because you, uh, in all, you on the, on the front lines uh, of research will be the ones oftentimes who, who uh, notice or, or realize that there's a need for this before others do, um, especially in terms of when you're looking at, at data and, and, and trying to put together research profiles and you're thinking to yourself, now this is, um, obviously you have your own that you, that you gather through external research, but what we have here to work with from our last screening 10 years ago uh, and modeling 10 years ago is just not accurate anymore. It can't be. Um, and so uh, you're some of the first to really realize some of the some of the more um, obvious reasons for uh, to uh, conduct another one of these analyses. Now I'm going to touch a little bit on applying basic concepts on your own. Um, so you can glean a lot of large, a lot from large scale predictive analytics projects done by any third party or consulting firm or anything like that, um, and become sort of your own in-house research analyst. And some of you in the room, I'm sure, already are, uh, and that is, that's great. Um, for, those of you, for those of you who are, maybe, you can, maybe this will help um, you know, further refine your, your methods. And those of you who so far haven't done anything like this, then I would encourage you to, to start and be creative about it. Um, these, are things when, these are things that, um, that you can have a little bit of fun with, and uh, they don't have to be um, all that complex at all. Um, and you don't have to share them at all either, of course, uh, in most cases, and, and, unless until you find something good and promising. Um, so in order to do this, I would, I would pay close attention to the factors uh, that are used in the analysis um, that's done in a more large-scale one that, that, that gg a or another firm may do with you. Um, and those factors often include relationship, age, and, and past-giving behavior, um, especially as, as it pertains to your particular institution and not other gifts to other organizations. Um, so that you can apply these basic segmentation concepts in-house on your own um, using factors like that and any others that you see as uh, strong indicators of, um, of levels of connectivity and how much these individuals like you. Um, and overlay, overlay that with capacity, of course. Uh, and then you can develop a pretty basic formula that factors in financial capacity and your perceived level of, of affinity specific to your organization that a given prospect has in order to calculate uh, his or her and measure his or her approximate value um, to the organization. Um, obviously, everyone out there is valuable. When I say this, I, I mean um, as a, uh, a prospect for, for philanthropic support, um, as, a, as a prospective donor. Um, and the way you can do that is, is really just take their, whatever, their, whatever you see their capacity as, either whether that's an estimate provided from, a, from another, from somewhere like, somewhere like us, or something you've developed internally, or, or both. Um, you can take that figure and decide how much you can have your own scores if you, if you don't already have them from, from another firm. Again, I'm sure you, many of you have your own sort of internal affinity scores or likelihood scores. Um, and you can uh, put a certain amount of weight on that. So maybe maybe the, uh, on each score. So maybe the, the top score, um, let's call it the number one, you can, the point that you can attribute to that is, uh, let's say, um, one point. So 1.0. Uh, and then you multiply that times, um, or excuse me, it would be 5.0. 5. 5. I was thinking from the other way around. So for your top likelihood, um, um, Oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm so sorry. You would do 1.0 uh, is, is what I would recommend. Uh, and so for that, for that top uh, likelihood, um, and then multiply it times their capacity. So if you're, if you're the number one thought philanthropic priority, as, as it's perceived to be uh, from your perspective, then they're likely to, to give what their capacity is to you specifically. Whereas if they have less of a level of connectivity, so once again, we'll use the, we'll use the ABC just because uh, it's easier for, for me to think of and, and then explain to you. Um, so that A would get a 1.0, and you would multiply that by their capacity in order to sort of, in, in order to, to kind of get an approximate value of them as a prospect. Um, and then further down, maybe a, a C, you, they might have 
uh, whereas a B might have a 0.75 um, weight. So you'd multiply 0.5 times their uh, capacity in order to get an approximate value of their potential to, to support you philanthropically. Um, so that's kind of a basic formulaic way that you can, and you can obviously tweak it at all um, in order to fit your needs um, and your methods. Um, but that's just a recommendation that you can use. Um, and of course, running queries and, and doing things like this um, can be interesting and fun. Um, what, what really this will do is, um, if you're able to apply some of these methods, uh, and like I said, they are very, very simple, basic, um, um, but, but that you've learned from larger scale projects um, or any formulas like the one I just described throughout there, um, you can be creative and try new things. And what it will enable you to do is conduct your own sort of in-house analytics um, to a certain degree by implementing these basic formulas and segmentation strategies. Um, and that enhances your abilities as, as researchers to uncover potentially promising populations um, within your constituency with the, that are latent within the database um, that maybe perhaps have been overlooked before. Um, and obviously that is, um, you know, that is one of the uh, primary objectives of your, in your position. Um, and it's one of the reasons you are researchers. Um, so I just wanted to, to outline a couple of, of ideas there. Uh, this is a little bit more about who we are, if you're, if you're not very familiar with Grenzelbach, Clear & Associates, or GG&A. Um, and um, so we are a, a philanthropic management consulting firm here, founded in 1961. Uh, we're we're uh, principal office is here in Chicago, um, where I'm based. And we have um, clients across the entire philanthropic landscape. Um, and we've been involved in, in these fundraising analytics since the late 1980s. Uh, and we've really honed, honed our, um, our take of this and uh, or our approach to this and the way that we help um, deliver value to clients in the form of projects like predictive analytics um, and providing them with implementation steps and observations, recommendations derived from the finding. Um, so just in case you weren't familiar with us, there you go. Um, I want to thank you right now for, for all of your time and, and your participation. Uh, participation has been a pleasure um, to be able to, to talk with all of you um, about this topic. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Feel free, this is my contact information here, if you want to jot it down, feel free to reach out to me at any time um, by phone or email, and I'd be happy to discuss anything related to this talk or your, discuss your situation and objectives um, where you are currently. Um, and anything that we might be able to do for you as well. But I'd be happy to just to, just to get in touch. So feel free to reach out again. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much once again, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I will answer some questions now that I believe uh, Melanie uh, from APRA uh, has been um, collecting from me, if there are any. Um, Melanie, is it? Sure. We have two any? questions come in. The first one that came in was, what does the percentage of total adjusted value mean on slide 15? Um, so let me go back to that slide real quick. What this is, is what we're saying that those in discovery um, make up, and it gets a little complex, but those in discovery right here, the 2.8%, they make up the 2.8% of the, of the value with, um, in, using, a, using a more complex algorithm, the value of um, that, that factors in some other things, including um, primarily their capacity and their affinity level uh, or likelihood level to give specifically to you. Um, so we're saying in terms of our calculations there, the 2.8% or those 234 um, donor households currently in discovery um, make up 2.8% of the total value of, the, of your constituency, or, or at least actually uh, the total value of all of your managed prospects in active stages in, in this case. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next question is, what are the most common variables would you recommend to use in the models for prospect research? Most common variables uh, to use in the in the in the in a predictive fashion. Um, again, I would say primarily um, you're going to want to look at past giving behavior. Um, so not only that that would include uh, cumulative lifetime total giving um, and also number of gifts, um, largest gift size, most recent gift, 
the most recent gift size and the dates of, of, of those uh, those gifts. So the most recent gift and the largest gift. Um, so historical giving analysis is, is very important in laying the foundation for any sort of predictive analysis. Um, so once again, that's t lifetime total cumulative giving, um, number of gifts, um, lo the largest gift and largest gift date, most recent gift amount and most recent gift date. Uh, and then also age can help um, for, for a variety of reasons, as, as you, many of you already probably know, um, but uh, sort of to get an idea of the life stage that individual is in. Um, marital status is, is important, whether or not they have children present in the home. Um, and age can, can help to determine whether they're more likely to give to the annual fund or be a, a, a big gift donor, a major gift level donor, or um, if, if, if they're a plan giving, um, if they're their best prospect for, for plan giving, and really all major gift prospects are also plan giving prospects because plan giving is a form of major gift, obviously, but you can't ask everyone for requests. But if the individual is older with a really high capacity, um, perhaps a blended ask of, of major, for a major gift, uh, one time major gift and a, and a plan giving uh, proposal should, should be presented to them. Um, so again, that's that's their their past giving, age for the variety of reasons that I just mentioned, um, their relationship to you. So be it member or um, donor, um, alumni, um, what have you, um, and uh, or parents. Um, you know all all the different relationships that you have in your individual program. So relationship, age, past giving. Um, and I would also, like I said, factor into anything that can that can stand out as, as what life stage they're in. So if they're ma if they're married or have children, or if children are, are, are out of the home now, um, can shed some light on their financial their financials and um, how much they might have available. Uh, and also, um, as a final one, I would consider their uh, where they live. Um, so if if they're in a High, if they're in a high income area, obviously. Um, so zip code can be can be interesting too if you have that available to you and you and you know a little bit about that zip code. Um, with some of the work that we do, we we append um, demographic and socioeconomic data that really from from two sources, Axiom and, and Prism, um, and they can really help inform the ratings because they do provide us with that sort of information: lifestyle traits, um, philanthropic tendency. Um, age, marital status, presence of children, and um, you know what their interests are, where they where they lay. So I know that's kind of a, a long answer, but uh, I hope you're able to, to jot it down. Wonderful, thank you. It looks like those are the only questions that we had so far. But as Connor mentioned, please feel free to follow up with him or direct your questions to speakers at apprahome.org. Thank you to each of you for participating in this webcast. Please note that this webcast will be available for purchase in the online store by the end of the day today. We appreciate Connor and everyone else online for attending the event today. Please be sure to complete the evaluation for today's event, which you will receive, which will pop up at the end of this webcast. Your feedback and input are important and appreciated as we further develop our online solutions showcase, showcase program. Thank you again for attending today's webcast and have a great day.